are, and does it come off? Yes, I do. Uh, I kind of wander around. The, uh, I think there's a couple of chairs left, maybe not, for you guys. Anyways, it is great to be here. Uh, I have never been here before. I have to say, I didn't even know about it. Uh, and uh, I had been pretty close to Venice several times, but I hadn't really ever come to Slovenia. And uh, I didn't know anything about it until I was invited to be a judge for this uh, competition. And it was kind of amazing to see uh, how great the design is here. The level of design is fantastic, and the judges are going to comment on that uh, later today. But uh, we are, we're, I'm, all, I'm very impressed, and I think all of us here are, are very impressed uh, with what you're doing. The, the general level is, is much better than most cities in the world, and the enthusiasm for design uh, is really great. So uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to uh, try to add something to that, but I think you're already doing really great uh, here. Do, do my fellow judges agree? Yes? Yes! Thank you. So. Um, I'm going to do a kind of basic talk today. I always like to start at the beginning. Uh, it's, it, it's, if you start at the beginning and build up, it's, it, you, you don't leave people behind. I'm sure that you as a designer are ahead of a lot of the ideas and know some of the things I'm saying, uh, or may have strong disagreements, and I hope we have time for, for some comments um, from you. But the, the, in my uh, life, uh, at I have been very conscious of the kind of imperative to be revolutionary. That is, this is maybe an American idea or a Western idea, but the notion is that, that uh, in the modern era, uh, in the 20th century, uh, design and kind of intellectual work was judged on how, how revolutionary you were. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of examples of that. So the whole modern movement in art uh, was a major departure. What do we, by revolution, is, is really the, the, re, the revolving, the, the circular motion, the going completely to, in the other direction, uh, reversing course, or going, now, some, somebody said last night when I was talking about this was, yeah, but doesn't that mean you get back to the same place again? And that's kind of maybe, maybe the, the ending of my story, but the, the, uh, <laughs> I, know, I, know, I felt the pressure as a, as a young designer to be modern, to break out, and I didn't get it. I didn't really, uh, I didn't understand it. Uh, I've never really fully understood the modern imperative, and the nice thing about modern is it's now viewed as a moment in time, as a style, a historical period. Uh, the, in the art world, the Concurrent art is referred to as contemporary art. Uh, modern art is something that existed from the early 20th century through the 50s and started trailing off. Uh, in graphic design, the modern, the kind of uh, gods of modernism uh, were the Bauhaus and the idea that you would, uh, you would, you would go in an entirely different direction. Now, the corollary or the the the, the kind of uh, partner in, in thinking to the word revolutionary is the word radical. And for many people, they mean the same thing. But my, my definition of radical has to do with, with the, the roots of the word radical, which is root, that uh, a radical designer, a radical artist, is trying to get to the root of the style, the root of the problem, uh, the root of the culture, uh, and then build back up. And my view is that that's the way you want to go. That that's a much more interesting idea than, than revolutionary. In typography, and of course, most of my work has to do with type because I'm a publication designer. Uh, we we have Paul Renner's uh, famous Futura typeface, and this was the, his what he submitted to the foundry. Uh, I guess it was Bauer in uh, the early 30s, late 20s. Uh, 1930 time frame. The lowercase was revolutionary. Uh, the sad part about making revolutionary type design is that if you move too far away from the basic code of the letters that people know, whatever language, in this case Latin, you can't read it. 
And uh, so the code, in town you learn the new code. Uh, and I think that's what he was hoping, that he, that, that he, could, he could push the code. <coughs> but the, the uppercase is not revolutionary. The uppercase, it turns out, is, is, is radical. It, it, it's going back to the root of Latin letter forms. And the funny thing about that is, I mean, I'm not the first person to point this out, but let's go back to the, to the Latin letter form. And here, uh, you know, 2,100 years ago, uh, they built, they were, the emperor Trajan was building the forum in Rome. And uh, there's a famous column, which is still standing. And it has a famous inscription at the base of the column over a door, which for one reason or another has been accepted by uh, historians and type people as the kind of poor Latin. This is the, the basic Latin letter form. Now, uh, at HIP in Amsterdam last week, I heard people say, yeah, but of course there's much better Latin inscriptions than, than the Trajan column, which I think is funny. I mean, there undoubtedly are. And, but this has been widely accepted, and in, in uh, it was used uh, in various revivals of Latin letter forms over the centuries, the Carolingian revival under Charlemagne, uh, and then what happened nearby in Venice in the 15th century with the type, types done by Nicholas Jensen, which are the first Roman types, 1470. We'll get back to that in a minute. But, um, okay, cool. What does this have to do with Futura? Here is Futura, current version of Futura, overlaid <coughs> on the Trajan column. Now, I'm not the, turns out I'm not the first person to do this. This is kind of an obvious idea. But I was just curious. It's the same thing. I mean, it's shockingly the same. The, the, the weighting, the, 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 uh, the, the swell on the letters, the thicks and thins are a little different. I mean, there are no thicks and thins in Futura. <laughs> but, uh, but it's the same letter form, the same proportion scheme. What is that all about, this kind of Greek and Roman sense of proportion? Where does that come from? And, you know, in architecture, which is what we're most familiar with, in, in, in that legacy, they had uh, these buildings that still look fantastic. And what is that all about? There are a lot of details that are important, like the way that light hits the building. But also their proportions, and the proportions of the letters are very important, the way that they, the, uh, the Romans, uh, following the Greeks and the Phoenicians, followed a very simple uh, scheme of having uh, square or round letters. Uh, as, as the uh, kind of simplest letters, but then if they were complex and were stacked like a, a, an uppercase B, they would simply put two, two squares on top of each other, so they would be half the width of an O. And these kinds of senses of proportions were built into the letter form and became part of the code. In architecture, what was built in was the, the golden rectangle. And what is that? I, I, I am, my, my assumption of, of the golden rectangle is that is has to do with binocular vision. That we look out of two eyes and we see this square, and this rectangle. It's not a square. Uh, it's not it's not 169. It's not panavision. It's uh, it's it's this. And here it is drawn out. It's a square with half a square next to it. Um, how? What, why is it? I mean, the only reason why that could have survived so much, become the core of, of, of classical proportions, is that it's, there's something innately physical and human about it. And we keep seeing it. Uh, this machine that I got on, my, on the table is uh, the golden rectangle on the screen. It's kind of, once you realize that, it's like, it kind of changes everything. So my feeling is that if you are a designer, and want to get ahead, it's better to start with the culture than it is to turn the culture over. That if you take the direction of, of what people see, the, the, the accumulated vision of, of, the, of the race, and build on top of that, you're probably going to get better than if you try to turn it around. Now, that doesn't mean we don't need radical reforms, and we don't need to get back to the basics, and we, have to, we don't need very clear communication. We, that's what design is. But I think that if we understand these conventions, what the code is, we'll go farther. So um, my, my slogan kind of is, good design is always effective, but it is not always new. So you have to make it work, but you can make it work if you, if you work, work with the culture. So that's the difference between revolutionary and radical. So 
in my career, I started uh, a long time ago. 1970 was the first job, I, or the first magazine I did. The first time I was an art director as, a, as separate from an editor was 1972 at a publication in Los Angeles. Uh, I, did, was, I got off to a very fast start. I was lucky because I appeared at a time when uh, art direction of magazines was having a boom and all, magazines suddenly all wanted to be designed. Uh, so I got the, a job at Rolling Stone, and I'll show you more about that. But um, in the 80s, which was sort of uh, the, you know, the time when I was really getting my, into stride as a designer, uh, th things moved on. The style had moved on from where, where we were in the 70s. And uh, there, there was a magazine called The Face, uh, by, designed by Neville Brody in London, which had, uh, had, a, kind of uh, had a kind of revolutionary feeling. There was a certain Baroque quality, but it was moving in a different direction. And then uh, later, uh, there was the magazine uh, Ray Gun uh, in the 90s, which also had uh, a kind of revolutionary feel. And I'll just show you one spread. This was David Carson. One spread from uh, kind of a bad slide, but you get the idea. Uh, very fun, different, makes no damn sense. Um, so the question, you know, I don't have, I don't think we have time to go through the whole story of that, but Neville, after doing the face for several years, moved to, just completely walked away from that uh, revolutionary idea and did, took on classical modernism in uh, the magazine called Arena. David Carson followed the, the revolutionary boat until it went over the horizon and he sort of disappeared. That was, you know, the, the problem with those kind of, when you take a right angle or a revolutionary turn away from the way, the direction of the culture, you might, it might be really fun and sensational and you might have some hits, but then what's your next act? And I think that uh, that's the problem that David has had to deal with. Um, so don't start over. So, and the, the old phrase is stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, so get to know your history. Learn, uh, learn, learn where it's coming from. So I, I, I left out a slide here that I should put back in, which is uh, between the, the, the re revivals that I was referring to uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the Latin letter form, <coughs> the, uh, the Trajan column. You know, Jensen, as part of the Italian Renaissance, print, did the very first Roman typeface in 1470, not far from here. Um, then, that slowly morphed, styles changed. It went Baroque and then went what they called modern, which was like uh, the Badoni Dido typefaces. But during that, during uh, every now and then, there would be a, a classical revival. Uh, the the French, uh, you know, tried to go back. Uh, Germain and, and Jean Janon uh, tried to go back. Um, every now and then, some, someone would want to do a revival. In the 20th century, the Monotype Corporation, led by Stanley Morrison tried to revive uh, these, these, uh, these Italian Renaissance typefaces. They did. They were very successful. But in the 19th century, uh, a, a, kind of un, a, a kind of an odd guy to figure this out, uh, William Morris, who is an arts and crafts designer, uh, printer, craftsman, uh, writer, uh, did a, a version of, of uh, Jensen's fonts that he called the golden type, uh, giving the impression that this was the center, this was the, you know, the, the, uh, the lodestone of, of typography. Uh, but notice he surrounded it with all this Victorian stuff. Uh, and, and yet it's really beautiful. <coughs> His feeling was Jensen was very heavy and had a kind of, he liked black letter, and so the darkness of, of Jensen was good. Probably he was looking at books that were just uh, printed from older type or was were overprinted, but in any case, uh, this had an enormous impact. It, every type foundry in England and the U.S. and, and, and most in, in the continent made a Jensen or, or uh, a fake uh, a fake golden type, with, uh, an imitation of golden type. In those days, the types didn't really travel very much; they were copied. Uh, it's kind of like music today, and the uh, the thought is that that um, in the United States, uh, one one uh, one foundry made a copy of Golden Type, and, and uh, basically 
William Morris wrote that they should go to hell for this. And so they produce another copy of a William Morris typeface, and they call it satanic. <laughs> Which I, so, all right, so this is a very important typeface. A lot of newspapers used it as headlines uh, or copies of it. And it was around, it had fallen out of use. And in 1975, I got to Rolling Stone. And I, one of my assignments was to come up with a typeface for the magazine. And uh, I said, OK. Uh, why don't we pick one that's got some classical roots that might last? I mean, I, I was saying, which is, if you pick a typeface that's at least 50 years old and it still looks good, the chances are that it will last another six months. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you're designing print, that's, you're, you're really only interested in just the very, the very, a very few uh, amount of days. You're not talking about, unless you're doing books, if you're designing magazines or newspapers, what newspapers last a day, and if the typeface could just last for a short period of time, you'll be all right. Uh, the problem with most new typefaces, they don't last that long. So uh, let's try an old one. And so I, I started, it, it, rather than doing a kind of big brand uh, design exercise, which I didn't even know how to do in those days, uh, I just started experimenting. Let's take a typeface and put it in the magazine, see what we think. Uh, so I used it everywhere. We did. This is a, a subscription. Uh, ad, there, there was a, a card that was glued onto the, onto it, which I lost. When Elvis died, I used this font, which is actually the American Type Editors, ATF Jensen Bold Condensed, for the, for the caption there. Uh, and then when we started redesigning the magazine, we, uh, we started using it uh, for, for headlines. And this is getting kind of badly dithered, but you get the idea. Now this is the old ATF face, but the R was something that we redrew. It was actually Jim Parkinson, was the guy who did the drawing. And then by this point, we were uh, we were doing uh, we we were actually uh, using our own font that Parkinson drew. Are these uh, I have to look back at the, these slides, but they're a little low risk. Anyway, you get the idea. I like this spread. Because I mean, we're talking about 1977, so it's a long time ago, and yet the page on the on the left doesn't look that different from current magazine pages, but the page on the right uh, looks in hilariously historical. I mean, look at that haircut. I mean, and the idea of these smoking cigarettes seems so. I mean, we we wouldn't even have a cigarette ad now, but that's. I, I like that juxtaposition. It shows you if you if you're thinking about this in a kind of more radical way, the chances are that you know, 30 years later it might still look okay. Uh, this was the 10th anniversary issue where we put that font onto the logo. And later, uh, actually right after that, Jan Winter, the owner, uh, wrote a message to, to Jim Parkinson saying that he thought the logo should be embellished back with some of the, curly, the, the swashes that it had in the old days. Uh, and they did. They, they, they put that on. Anyways, I'll show you a couple of, of, of uh, covers with this logo. And, and this shows you the cultural era. This was Springsteen and, and Patti Smith. They were the kind of main icons of, of, pop, of, of the of popular music as far as Rolling Stone believed it. This is a recent Google search for Rolling Stone cover. And you get an idea. Uh, how that fairly careful, slow exercise back in the 70s stuck. White backgrounds, so much, I mean, like that Brad Pitt cover there, that's the Rolling Stone font. You, they, it keeps showing back up again. Uh, the logo did get uh, banged on the head by, by uh, Parkinson again, but um, eh, this little one down here, is, you can see, is the, is the logo I did. Uh, that's from that in 1977, 78 era. But, that's a kind of brand equity. That's visual branding. That, that's what Rolling Stone looks like. This is still a million circulation in the United States. This is a, continues to be a successful magazine. Of course, there's a lot of digital side to it now, but it's, it's, still, it's still in print. Uh, so you see, this is 1967 on the left with the original logo. This is how the logo got cleaned up in the way it was when I was there, and then, um, then the way it was when I redesigned it. 
and this is it today. Well, <laughs> slightly sexier covers than we would have done. So, <coughs> if you, you, your instinct might be to tear everything down and start over, but I don't know if that's always the way to do it. Uh, if you're inventing a new brand, you, you can do whatever you want. But if you're, if you're working with an existing product, uh, it's interesting to think about what, what could you do that carries the forward momentum, that holds on to the equity that they've got. So I, I'm going to get out of publication for a short time and just show, think, think about you know, some, of the, some other long-term exercises. And Shell Oil, uh, Royal Dutch Shell, has pretty much, uh, from 1904 onward, had the same logo, same mark, same <laughs> trademark. They put a logo in it in the 50s, so 48. And then they had uh, Raymond Lowy come in and <coughs> clean it up in the 70s, early 70s or late 60s. And he put a big, he, he reduced the number of flutes and put a big uh, border around it. And then more recently, but it's been over ten, uh, about 10 years, they, uh, more than 10 years, they, they took off the word shell. If you don't know that's a shell, you're out of luck. Um, other, others have not been so lucky. Now, this is a, the U.S. Airlines, American Airlines. And this is what it looked like um, when I was a kid. This is a, a DC-7 <coughs> four-engine plane. And they had this wonderful orange stripe with a kind of lightning bolt thing in the front. And fu essentially, Futura bold condensed italic, spaced out badly. Uh, they, they took it back to Roman, but kept kept the, I mean, you never really want a letter, you never want to space out letter space, condensed type, but they did. And this is their first jet, the 707. <laughs> they polished the airplane, metal, the, the aluminum. So that was their brand, this orange and aluminum. And then um, they had Massimo Vignelli come in, in the early 70s, and fix it, make it modern. So they tossed the, the lightning bolt, they tossed the color scheme. They, they kept the eagle, but they made it part of a, a big AA symbol on the back. And, uh, and, and it was American, we're going to have red, white, blue. And then, of course, there's, you know, Massimo, so it's Helvetica. That's not very American, but what the hell. <laughs> and uh, that lasted until last year. Um, it's hideous, but everyone got used to it. And it lasted as, almost as long as the, as the lightning bolt. And then last year they did this. And I, 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 when I first saw it, I thought, my god, Elton John designed it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a red, white, and blue keeper. <laughs> the, uh, the eagle got very squished. It's done as a kind of slash. Back. Back, backward slash. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, and then they painted the plane uh, because now planes aren't aluminum. There are all these composites and different parts of the fuselage could actually be different materials, so they, they couldn't just polish it anymore. Now I see these in the United States and they look okay. It's, uh, I've gotten used to it. Uh, so, but they kind of lost something here. I, mean, I think they've forgotten where they came from. Uh, Here's another one that, so you know, I start wondering, okay, I'm getting older, do, am I just nostalgic? Is this like, I just like the old stuff? No, I don't think so. There's really old bad stuff that I don't like. But uh, I don't think this, I think this may be Raymond Lowy too, the, the logo on the left uh, for the US Postal Service. And it was a modernization in the 60s or 70s. And it's pretty horrible, but it's okay. And, then they did this on the right, on the right to modernize it. It's funny how people always say, oh, we'll modernize it by taking the crossbar out of the uppercase A. It's like, where did they get that from? Is that from old science fiction movies? I don't, I don't know. Uh, so that then, and then we'll tilt it. It's going it's forward looking. And there's still this eagle. I mean, um, it's pretty frightening. Worse is the United Parcel Service, UPS it's called now, uh, had a Paul Rand logo, and you can just hear the CEO saying, my God, we've got to get rid of that B. 
O on the logo, and we look like idiots. See, it's a, we don't even allow people to put string on packages anymore. <laughs> and it's part of our logo. And so they hired somebody and they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and they came up with this thing. That is sad. And it, you know, okay, it's a shield, it's still a shield, but it really is sad. Another one is Pepsi. You know, and I wouldn't even drink Pepsi, it's horrible stuff. But um, they had this thing, I think it was in the 50s or 40s, where they took the old logo, which is kind of a 19th century script, and they put this kind of interesting sw swirl, uh, red, uh, red and blue. And then somebody in the, in the modern era said, we'll make it yin and yang. <laughs> it would be kind of American soda pop, yin and yang. And then last year, two years ago, somebody said, no, that's too boring, let's get rid of that. And they probably just did some kind of uh, Adobe Illustrator blending thing and just tried different things until, okay, we'll use that one. <laughs> so what, what are they thinking? Where are they going? Uh, what does this mean? Now I can take you back to publications. This was the first Newsweek with a hyphen. Um, and it actually was redder than that, it looks kind of orange. Uh, and then these are just the Newsweeks over time. Uh, actually, time is the right word because the time, people from Time Magazine, when this one started, said, you can't do that. We have a red border. It's our trademark. You've got to stop doing that. So they hired a famous uh, publication designer in the 1950s whose name is Dr. Aga, M.F. Aga. I don't know if anyone has heard of him anymore. He was very, very important uh, about the time I was born. And so he did this. And Newsweek called it the coat hook because it was like a hook, coat hook, like a, a, a dry cleaner hanger. Uh, but it was just the hook part. And he condensed the logo, gave it a little white space. Kind of nice. Now, in those days, the color was printed in advance, and then they would keep this in the yellow uh, snipe, it's called. They would print on black uh, a news headline. And then into the 60s, it modernized and started changing colors every week. And then you can hear the refrain, the constant chanting in the background, or if you speed up the, the tape, of the editor saying, make the logo bolder. Could we make the logo bolder? And they kept doing that. <laughs> and tell uh, this is the, this is really the, in 1980, late 70s, uh, it was so bold, there was hardly any counters left in the letters. And so this is when I came in, I said, let's go back a step. We'll take part of the coat hook. And people said, it was very interesting, in nine, six months after I redesigned it, this is 1985, about the time you were born, and, or earlier, and um, we had a, a, uh, a, a, a reader survey six months after the redesign, and, I, and we said, how long has Newsweek looked this way? And it was like two weeks, six months, the correct answer, two years, always. And 60% of the people picked always. And that's, that to me is a successful redesign. So then over the years, I tweaked it a few times. Uh, and I actually redesigned Newsweek four times. And then the fifth time, they rejected it and did this. So they took the logo out of its stripe that I had used and put it in a box, and then they made it a sans serif logo. And this is, if you are any publisher, if you're a publisher in the audience, this is a lesson to you. Because they kept going in this kind of, you know, dissolute way until they stopped. It was only two years from the beginning of that, that design when Newsweek went out of business. I mean, it's, it's gone as a print magazine in the U.S. Esquire, different, different story, a little sweeter ending. Uh, Esquire was a men's magazine from the starting the 30s. It had this kind of nice script logo. It was kind of regularized, and, and um, we're not sure who did this logo. It's like the US Post Office logo that, that you're using now. Th there is no way of finding who did that. It's, uh, <laughs> that person probably is in the, the, you know, the uh, identity 
program from the federal government. Uh, you, you can't find him. And so, I, I believe Ed Bengat, as a very young kid in the art department of Esquire, did this logo, but I know he did this one. Uh, so he took that script and they kind of made it into what looked like a, an automobile nameplate. Like, uh, you can imagine it saying Rambler. And, uh, and then made it, you know, more, more horizontal, more, more Cinerama. And then they went back a step uh, after, after a couple of uh, variations. And then I got there. <coughs> oh, this is out of sequence. And it looked like this, but when I got there in the early 90s, and I said, let's put this script back on. <coughs> and, you know, get it back to more hand-drawn. And this, okay, that logo, the previous logo with the squared off script had been in use for 40 years by that time, or 30 years. So I didn't have any real expectation that this idea would work. I was, the, the company was totally against it. This is terrible, can't do this. And I just did it. You know, one of the things you have to do sometimes to the designers is just you know, get stubborn as a designer. And then this is it recently. And here's another Google search. So here, here's es Esquire also looking like it, like it has brand identity. This is all fairly recent. Okay, that was 92, <coughs> 93, whenever it was that I changed the logo. So it's 20 years. Um, and <coughs> they're still using that script. They added drop shadows, they take the drop shadows off. They put outlines, they take the outlines off. But it's still pretty much the same drawing. Now, uh, another project that, I mean, another uh, publication that I worked on, but this, of course, is not this necessarily. This is the first website for the New York Times, 1996. And it's hilarious. I'm sorry the resolution's so bad, but it's a, um, it's funny because it was trying to look like the New York Times. Look how little it is. And then this is the website sort of that they have now. They've, they've tweaked it, tweaked it, and they, it still hasn't changed. They've released pictures of what it's going to look like. Um, but they did, um, they did something in the interim that I did work on. I worked at the Times in the uh, 80s, after Newsweek. I went there for, for a few years and actually became the chief art director briefly uh, in 1984. <coughs> no, it was before Newsweek. Uh, and anyways, some years <coughs> later, in the mid-90s, or no, early 2000s, Microsoft asked me to come help them do a, new, a reader that worked on PCs for the New York Times. And that's what this is. This is what I designed. And this is my first effort to do responsive design. That is, a instead of designing a page, design a system of relationships between the type and pictures that could be resized to different pages. So ads would show up, or others, other, you'd get more columns. And uh, this is the the current New York Times iPad app, which is kind of a descendant of that. And one thing that they've done, which is really nice, is that they've started varying the typography of the different uh, the different uh, sections. So opinion has different headline style. The news, so the news looks like that. Opinion looks like that. I mean, not that much different. But the you get to the magazine, they actually put a cover on it. When Oliver gets up, we'll talk about scrolling, but uh, I'll leave that conversation out for now. Um, this is the, the, the magazine contents. This is a magazine story. So there's at least three different templates for what stories can look like. Uh, opinion, features, or magazine features, and news. That's good. This is the current design. So uh, that's pretty much my, my talk. I, I say that the new doesn't always drive out the old. We still have trains, particularly in Europe, uh, air passenger trains. We still have television. I mean, maybe we're downloading it instead of watching broadcasts, but we still, it's still there. Things just pile up. We, get, we, we, can, we, we could lose print if we can't figure out what the business model is. But uh, I don't think we want to start over with the media. I think we want to build on what we know. And maybe it will last for a while. So that's my talk. Thanks very much for coming this morning.